Forget Abdul Carter, the star linebacker. How about Abdul Carter, the star defensive end, as Penn State is moving him from that linebacker spot to putting his hand in the dirt on the line of scrimmage. And for James Franklin and Tom Allen, this was a no-brainer. You are Locked On Nittany Lions, your daily podcast on the Penn State Nittany Lions, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is going on, Penn State fans? That is right. You are locked on Nittany Lions. Thanks so much for making us your first listen and watch every single day. We are free and available wherever you get your podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. I am your host, Zach Seiko, bringing you all things Penn State Nittany Lions. And today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. And right now, new customers. When you sign up today, you will get $150 in bonus bets if your first bet of $5 is a winner. It's that simple. It's that easy. All you got to do is visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On to get started. And if you're not already, become an everyday or subscribe to Locked On Nittany Lions on YouTube and wherever you get your podcast for the latest analysis and conversations around your favorite Penn State sports teams. We're talking football in this episode and kind of a double feature here is we've had a lot of conversations about Penn State over the course of this week, but with the news that Abdul Carter is switching positions, I felt like this was uh, an emergency podcast if you will, was needed. Let me know in the comments what you think about this one. And you want to hear your thoughts. Abdul Carter, who wears number 11, which is given to linebackers, is moving to the front of the defense to play defensive end along Denai Dennis Sutton. And in short, I like this move. I like this move a lot. Abdul, because, because of two reasons. One, Abdul Carter is just a, a freak of nature. He's very talented. He's very athletic. And there's, of course, the parallels between himself and Micah Parsons. We've seen Micah Parsons do it at the NFL level, moving from linebacker to being a pass rusher, just a disruptor of the, on the line of scrimmage. And Abdul Carter can do the exact same thing. But I also want to preface that because just because he's moving to defensive end doesn't mean he can't play anywhere else. It doesn't mean that he can't shift back to linebacker. It doesn't mean that Tom Allen can't get creative. I asked him a question in the introductory press conference. Hey, you know what? How do you how do you want to see yourself using the number eleven player inside of your defense? And he said, "Well, Abdul." He talked about Abdul Carter and just how special of a player he was. Well, special players can be used in special ways. So Abdul Carter will have more of a pass rushing presence because he was already doing that to begin with. He already was, but. If Penn State needs him in passing down situations, what it does is it balances out the depth. That's what this does. It balances out the depth. It puts Abdul Carter in more of a position to succeed. It also allows Penn State's defense in a, in a better position to succeed as well because a staple of Tom Allen defenses is the 4-2-5. So you're not going to see as much of the 4-3. You're going to see, yes, you're going to see a 4-3 base defense, but you're also going to see some 4-2-5. Part of that's Tom Allen scheming. Part of that's the competition you're going to play. You're going to see those Pac-12 schools that like to air it out, which means you're going to need more corners. You're going to need more defensive backs on the football field and linebackers that can cover. I'm not saying Abdul Carter can't, but with more passing means you need a better pass rush. And you're losing not only Chop Robinson, but Adisa Isaac as well. Jimmy Alliance has a lot of potential. I mean, Vanover's coming back. Zariah Fisher has recovered well from his injury. That's almost forgettable at this point with the way that he has progressed back to his full form. But now Abdul Carter just adds on top of that. Deny Dennis Sutton, right? We're talking about Deny Dennis Sutton now who could embrace his potential of being a future first-round pick. Former five-star recruit out of high school. He's practically unblockable. But now defenses, are, or now offenses, I should say, are forced. They're not able, they're not going to be able to chip deny Dennis Sutton all the time. They got to focus on Abdul Carter. So quarterbacks in the Big Ten have been put on notice. And why you can do this with Abdul Carter. Abdul Carter moving to defensive end is a smart move. You now have both sides of the line of scrimmage being attacked by phenomenal athletes. Deny Dennis Sutton a little bit bigger, but Abdul Carter still has a good frame. Six foot three. 250 pounds. He might, maybe he adds a little bit of weight. Maybe he adds five or 10 pounds or so because he'll be on the line of scrimmage. But don't think just because he's listed at defensive end, he still has linebacker capabilities. And we saw how Manny Diaz used Chop Robinson a season ago. Chop Robinson lined up at, you know, the five or the seven technique 
would line up in the A and the B cap, the one, uh, one technique right over top of the center. Abdul Carter was doing that as a linebacker. Tom Allen's not Manny Diaz, but he can do very similar things like that. He can line up Abdul Carter over center. He can line up Abdul Carter. You can have that three defensive end look again on obvious passing situations where you have Abdul Carter lined up in the middle. You have denied Dennis Sutton and then a combination of Amin Van over and Zariah Fisher factor in Jamil Lyons. All of these guys are, are very, Penn State wants to have about six capable defensive ends. And that's what Abdul Carter does. Let's go back to linebacker because you're not making this decision if you don't feel secure in that position. You have Tony Rojas, who's going into his second year. KB on keys, Tamir Robinson. I know they play different parts of the linebacker spot. Dom DeLuca, Tyler Elsden, of course, Kobe King. Kobe King is coming off his best season of his Penn State career. You aren't allowed to make this kind of gamble. I don't even want to call it a gamble. You're not allowed to make this kind of move without having the certainty behind you at that second level. So I think what this says is that Penn State is very confident in possibly move. And any of these linebackers, maybe aside from Dom DeLuca and Tyler Elsden playing that weak outside linebacker spot or being that pass coverage linebacker, the easy answer is Tony Rojas. Tony Rojas steps up here. But it also means that there are opportunities. They like what they've seen from Keon Wiley, who's going, who's a redshirt sophomore now, and KB on keys. The, the first person up after Abdul Carter was Keon Wiley. So when they do go in a 4-3 base, you will see Wiley step up as that weak side linebacker, that off-the-ball linebacker. And Keon Wiley has flashed bits of talent as well. So you're, you're getting the best of both worlds by adding Abdul Carter's just presence as a defender, just an overall disruptor of the football game. And then bringing on somebody where there's not too much of a significant, because yes, there is a drop off from the linebacker position. Abdul Carter is better than Tony Rojas and KB on keys, but now you are getting better by adding Carter to that defensive end spot and sliding in a Tony Rojas. But that's what it's really banking on. You are banking on Tony Rojas becoming that next star linebacker. I'm not saying that, you know, hey, he takes over the number 11 jersey. He is targeting it, though. He would love to wear number 11 as soon as Abdul Carter is ready to go to the NFL. But you have options at the linebacker spot. And I feel like there's going to be an open competition. Kobe King is a lock at the Mike linebacker. But now Tony Rojas is probably going to slide over, compete with KB on keys, compete with, compete with Keon Wiley. And who's to... And, you don't have to have one play all or nothing in terms of snaps. Tony Rojas can give you his best, give you 100%, and then you can rotate Keon Wiley, and then you can move guys around. You're, you have depth at the linebacker spot. Don DeLuca can start at the strong outside linebacker spot. Tyler Elsden can slide into both of those, the backup Mike linebacker, and rotate in as the strong linebacker position. This is a very coordinated plan for Penn State's defense. I am a huge fan of it. Penn State is doing the right thing here. And again, if something changes at linebacker, if this move doesn't entirely work out, I feel confident that Jameel Lyons is going to have a break, start to break out in his second year with Penn State. Zariah Fisher and Amin Vanover are capable defensive ends as well. They, one of them was going to start. I thought they would be co-starters going into this season, and I was okay with that. But Abdul Carter himself is a better disruptor than both of them as co-starters, and that's obvious, not that that needs to be said. But if this move doesn't work out, slide him back. Slide him back. So there's almost this insurance policy as well. You're getting the best of both worlds. You can use Abdul Carter in a variety of ways. You can just have him be a disruptor. The defense has to account for him. Micah Parsons does the same thing with the Dallas Cowboys, where he is just all over the place. You have to account for him in some way, and you almost can't game plan for it because now Abdul Carter is not boxed in to one spot. This is a genius move by Tom Allen and James Franklin going into the season. And again, if it, if it is a bit of a stretch, they can always move him back, and then the defense will still be firing on all cylinders. Now, Abdul Carter isn't the only player to change positions. Talk a little bit more about the defensive depth chart, plus those players that are switching positions, and if it will have an imp impact on the depth chart as well. That is coming up next here on Locked On and Alliance. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel, the official sports book of Locked On. 
Get buckets with your first bet on FanDuel, America's number one sports book, because right now new customers get $150 in bonus bets if your first bet of $5 is a winner. It's that simple. That's $150 bucks if your bet wins. Bet on all of your favorite NBA players and teams with quick bets, live same game parlays, exclusive props, and so much more. You can combine all of those bets that you like, those plays, into one same game parlay for bigger winnings, a bigger payout. Just visit FanDuel.com slash lock and shoot your shot. That's FanDuel.com lock on to get started. FanDuel, an official sportsbook partner of the NBA. And the Locked On Podcast Network is making history. Locked On has launched the first ever National Sports 24 streaming channel on YouTube, and it can now be found on Amazon Fire TV in the free Fire TV channels app. Locked On Sports Today is here for you 24-7, covering the top sports stories of the day with the local experts of Locked On, plus the national shows covering each and every league. Find Locked On Sports Today now on YouTube and the free Fire TV channels app. Depth chart implications. And like I said, Abdul Carter is not the only player to make a position change. There's three other Nittany lines, but I've already mentioned, right? The line, linebackers and defensive end are most important. You now have two starting defensive ends with Denai Dennis Sutton, Abdul Carter, Zariah Fisher, and Amin Vanover can now rotate wherever. You're not going to have that co starter spot and almost anchor two players to one side. You can now have the flexibility, the movement to move Jameel Lyons around, to move Fisher to move Vanover, and then at linebacker, you are banking on that Kavion Keats, Tony Rojas, Keon Wiley, just to name a few, even Tamir Robinson, that they're going to see an expanded role and do well with the responsibility. I think they can, but that's what the depth chart looks like. Immediately, Keon Wiley in a 4-3 would probably take over that starting spot. You would have Kobe King, and then you would have Dom DeLuca, Tyler Elsden, Tony, Ro Tony Rojas is going to be a co-starter probably with Dom DeLuca at first, but probably co-starter at both linebacker spots. And then when they go into passing situations, when it's a 4-2-5 look, Kobe King and Tony Rojas are your best athletes at that linebacker spot. At that linebacker spot. So is Keon Wiley. So those three will be the first ones up in a 4-2-5 look at the linebacker spot. At the at the four three, you can you can get creative. You can cycle anybody in. Tyler, like I said, you'll have your main starters, Rojas or Keon Wiley. Kobe King is is for sure is a given is a certain is a certain lock at the Mike linebacker spot. And then Dom DeLuca or Rojas. Rojas could be a co starter at both of those linebacker spots in the four three. As for the other players that are making position changes, so Abdul Carter's one. Tyrese Mills is going to be moving from safety back to linebacker. He's kind of alternated positions. Tyrese Mills coming over from Lackawanna Community College, like Juan Brisker and Jair Brown hasn't exactly lived up to that billing, but is still a, an important depth piece. And why move Abdul Carter to defensive end? You're going to need move to somebody else to linebacker to add to that depth. Lamont Payne switching from cornerback to safety. That's uh, that. Not not as important, but it's definitely significant. He's a good defensive back. And Makai Flowers, this one is interesting. Makai Flowers came in as a defensive back, as a safety core, and mo mainly a safety, but a defensive back when he was recruited. And honestly, the reason I can speak on Makai Flowers a little bit is because when I was working at ESPN Radio State College, when it still existed, it's been disbanded since, but covering mid-Penn Commonwealth High School Football State College, where Penn State is, they fo they we were focusing uh, a lot of coverage on state college area high school and they faced teams central dolphin central dolphin east well makai flowers went to cd east went to central dolphin east and i thought he was a better playmaker as a wide receiver than he was as a defensive back and i'm like how is this guy being recruited as a defensive back i get it he plays both sides of the football but i saw him more as a wide receiver and Maybe just because of the open slot competition, I don't know where they're going to put him. I don't know where they're going to put him at wide receiver because they did have Christian Driver transfer out, and we've seen that. The experiment of moving Driver from a secondary spot back over to wide receiver like his father, Donald Driver, didn't exactly work, but now Flowers is going to try his chance, and I give Flowers a fair shot just as much as anybody else. Julian Fleming, Trey Wallace, Keandre Lambert-Smith even, are all going to be your starters. 
But then everybody after that, it is an open competition. I do not give any favoritism to Liam Clifford or Caden Saunders or Malik Mega, Malik McLean. It is an open competition as far as who gets those second reps and third reps. And you need all the help you can at wide receiver. And with how, how deep secondary has gotten, especially at the safety spot, the safety spot is probably the strongest position group, uh, one of the strongest position groups for sure, starting with KJ Winston and Jalen Reed. But then you have Zach He Wheatley, right? That's why they're making all these changes. And they feel comfortable taking Tyrese Mills back to the linebacker spot and moving Makai Flowers away as well. So I, I think that one's important to note here. But as far as playing time goes, L Lamont Payne might not play as much. He's added depth. Maybe you'll see him some on special teams. Tyrese Mills probably not going to play a whole lot at linebacker as well. But again, it's an open competition. Like I said, the only secure spot is Kobe King. Dom DeLuca and Tony Rojas will see playing time. Same with Keon Wiley, but KB on keys, Tamia Robinson, now Tyrese Mills. Who's going to be that next group of linebackers to play on the football field? Because start, starting lineups are almost meaningless. It's how many snaps you play. It's the same thing in basketball. You can be in the starting lineup, play only 10 minutes. Oh, but you're a starter. You're a starter. That's why they have a sixth man of the year award because that player off the bench will come in, play 30 minutes, and give you one of the best performances. If you start a football game, that's great, but not always do we see that the best player is in the starting lineup. Sometimes they're better suited to come off the bench, and that's why depth is so important here. So as for Mills and Payne, I think Mills has a, a better pathway to some playing time. I still think Lamont Payne has some development to go through and, and and needs to work on his skills, continue to build some muscle, add some weight to play at the college football level. Makai Flowers has been in the program now for a few years. He is turning into a veteran. And because of that need of somebody, somebody has to step up at wide receiver. We could see Makai Flowers see, maybe see some reps. I'm eager to see him in the spring football game, the blue and white game come April, to see what kind of progress he has made. And if he can take any playing time away, from other of those wide receiver counterparts. But that, that's really the some some small changes. Abdul Carter's the big one, but these position changes are are good for Penn State and, and has some impact on the depth chart, but not a whole lot outside of defensive line and linebacker. Now, big picture stuff. Penn State had its win total release. So did the Big Ten Conference, but nine and a half wins. That's an airtight total. I am going to join a locked on college football. And I talk with Spencer McLaughlin about if Penn State can beat this win total or if they're going to go underneath it and Vegas has the right has the right hook on it. That's coming up next here on Locked On Nittany Lions. Today's episode is also brought to you by Game Time. You got to download the Game Time app because buying tickets to your favorite events should not be stressful. Game Time is the fast and easy way to buy tickets for all of the sports, music, comedy and theater events near you. Now, I've used the Game Time app before, and what I like about the Game Time experience is you get last-minute tickets, but you also get flash deals, discounts on those last-minute tickets. It's easy to find and buy tickets for any kind of event in your area. It's all sorted for you. You don't have to go looking around. You know what is going on in your area. And probably the best feature, image views of the seats. You're not second-guessing. You're not wondering what that point of view is going to be like. You have that firsthand before you get there to the event or the venue. Also included, lowest price guarantee and event cancellation protection. So snag the tickets without the stress with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use promo code LOCKED ON for $20 off your first purchase. Again, create that account, redeem code LOCKED ON for $20 off your first purchase. Download Game Time today, last minute tickets, lowest price. Guaranteed. Is Penn State bound to have another double-digit win season in 2024? James Franklin is still the head coach, and, well, that's often been the case. Zach Seiko joining me here on Locked On College Football, host of Locked On Nittany Lions over there for Penn State. And let's hop right into it, Zach. Nine and a half, the win total for Penn State. Do you like that over or under with their schedule, which is, I won't say terrible, but it's far from a cakewalk. I, I would say it's a gauntlet, the schedule. Uh, so do I like the win to total? It is airtight. I, I've been kind of staring at that number for since it was released just about what? It's been a week now, I guess, or maybe close to five days for the Big Ten Conference. And nine and a half, that's what it was a season before. 
And, and I think Vegas is spot on with this. There is this is a Penn State team that is in that is above the top half of the rest of the Big Ten Conference. It's Ohio State, it's Oregon, and then it's Penn State, not too far behind, but they're trailing. They're trailing those two schools. They don't play Oregon. They play Ohio State at Beaver Stadium, but this is a schedule that is it's very tough. And it's probably one of the toughest in recent memories. I mean, you're facing USC. I know UCLA has gone through some changes, but you're facing three out of the new four schools from the Pac-12, and the Pac-12 is sending their best. They didn't send Washington State. They didn't send Oregon State. They didn't send Cal. They sent the four best schools. Hey, now, let's not be hating on the (laughs) Pac-2. I can't sit here and stand for that sort of slander, but you're right. They didn't send Cal and Stanford. I'll, I'll live with that. So, but yeah, so at Washington, I know they're going through some changes as well, but Jed Fish, look what he did with the turnaround at Arizona. And and he's able to get, you know, retain a good quarterback in Will Rogers out of the transfer portal. So Penn State's going to be challenged. I I think they're better than Washington. I know they're better than UCLA at this point, but Ohio State got that much better. But I also look at the way the schedule unfolds. Yeah, they play West Virginia. I think that's a win, even though that's a road game. But it's going to the West Coast that's going to pose a challenge because I want to kind of factor almost that they can only have one mulligan in this case with nine and a half wins, Spencer. That when they go out to USC Southern Cal in the middle of the season, and then they have a bye week, that's nice and all, but then you got to go back on the road to Wisconsin to Camp Randall. And I think Wisconsin's going to be better. So this schedule is very unforgiving. If Penn State drops one of those two games on the road at USC or at Wisconsin, I wouldn't be surprised. I'm also picking Ohio State at this point in time because of what they've done with the coaching staff and the transfer portal. So Penn State's in line for a 10 and 2 season once again, maybe an 11 and 1 season because they are better than all those other teams. But the way the schedule uh, unfolds for them, there is a chance that they could lose in one of those tougher road environments. So I'm thinking 10 and 2, which is over that 9.5, maybe even an 11 and 1 with just that lone loss to Ohio State. I think that schedule is tough. Missing Oregon is huge, getting Washington instead because the Huskies are going to, I think, have a better season than it felt like they were going to about a month ago when it was yep. just everyone and everything was leaving. But Washington has has done some work in the transfer portal. They'll have Will Rogers at quarterback. Jed Fish is a good coach. Jed Fish is a good play caller. So I don't think they'll be a conference contender, but they'll, they, they can be in the middle closer to the top than uh, the bottom. But I think they are firmly in the middle there. I like what you brought up about Wisconsin because going to Camp Randall, never easy. Just not not going to be. Luke Fickle's going into you know uh, another year in Madison in, in which mm-hmm. I feel good uh, about what he is building there and what they are capable of doing, what he can do as a head coach. Yeah. Maybe it's because I'm you know a West Coast kind of guy, but I'm very high on USC. And I think USC fans will tell you I, I'm not exactly what you would describe as a USC homer, but I think their offseason moves have been good. That's a long trip. I mean, when when there was in the middle of the season, you don't the, have a month to prepare for that hype of that Rose Bowl that they've done in the past. Right. And so that, I think, is at least advantageous. The players and coaches and everyone are familiar with going all the way over, but it hasn't been in the middle of the season. And I think that that is one of the premier trips that we're going to see a team make this year it is you're going to have Penn State play USC. I think both teams will be ranked around the time that that happens. Penn State schedule early. I like that you brought that up too because their schedule early, I think, is really favorable. You got the West Virginia game first. That's a winnable game. That that is absolutely winnable game. Then you go four straight at home, including the first two Big Ten games. I expect Penn State to be five and zero there. But then in the middle, the Ohio State at Wisconsin at USC. Boy, that, that stuff can get dicey. But let's talk about the team Penn State will be putting on the field. Drew Aller back at quarterback. James Franklin back at, at, at head coach. Correct me if I'm wrong. A new offensive coordinator has moved his way into the building. New defensive coordinator with Manny Diaz going to take the head coaching job at Duke. How do you feel about Penn State's offseason as it pertains to 2024? Because if they go 10-2 and two again, that's probably a college football playoff spot. Yeah, that is a college football playoff spot, assuming that they lose to, you know, Ohio State's going to be in the in the top three, most likely. And, and and that game's at Beaver Stadium. So do I lean Ohio State in that game? Yes, but it's not saying that Penn State couldn't win and, and surprise the Buckeyes, who will most likely be favored. As far as the offseason moves go, Penn State got its number one choices if they were going to have to make any replacements. They fired Mike Yersich. They they 
they put their nose to the ground and they started doing they started doing investigative work to say, hey, who are we going to bring in? And Penn State finally has James Franklin talks about alignment. I don't know how many people out of the Penn State stratosphere hear what James Franklin has to say uh, about alignment, but the president, the board of trustees, the athletic department, all on board with what his vision is for Penn State football and the program. And they got their number one target in Andy Kotelnicki for the offensive coordinator spot. They were able to outbid other schools because Penn State wasn't the only one that wanted Kotelnicki to take over as the OC. Oklahoma was another one of them. And then Tom Allen, who is a former head coach, James Franklin talks about how valuable it is to have a head coach at these coordinator spots. And that's exactly what they were. And special teams, they got Justin Lustig. So they have three new coaches at all three major coordinator spots. It, it, it is crazy to think that Penn State was a, a top 10 team, loses all three of those major coaches, and might have been able to upgrade two out of three of them. And that's no disrespect to, to Stacey Collins. We know Mike Yersich didn't work out in Happy Valley. But this time around, Penn State was able to pri go get their priority targets and bring them to Happy Valley. And that's a testament to the athletic director in Pat Crap. I like what they've done in the transfer portal. They've addressed needs. Have they done exactly enough may i'd like to see, to see more at wide receiver uh, offensive line as well but you got something something is better than nothing and, and i think you just needed veteran experience at, at the end of the day let alone you know talent's important but you just needed guys that can come in and almost act at you know immediate bridges to leadership and julian fleming does just that on top of he's a really good run blocker and penn state's run game wasn't that great and that'll help take pressure off of drew aller yeah, I think having Fleming in there to help unlock the downfield passing game is huge for the Nittany Lions offensively. And with a new staff, that's certainly something that I'll be looking for early in the year. And they've got to have it uh, loaded and ready to go week one because going to Morgantown is going to be no joke. That's uh, no, a bolt. Good. That's a bowl team and then some last year uh, under under Neil Brown for the Mountaineers. Zach Seiko, the host of Locked On Nittany Lions here on Locked On College Football. Zach, thanks so much for joining me. I'm glad to join anytime you need me, Spencer.